Hi, I'm Elaine. Welcome to my podcast channel. Good morning, uh, Dr. Bogan. How are you today? Very well, thank you. Yeah, uh, it would be great if you can self-introduce your um, math specialties and the department that you are currently in. Sure. So I'm retired from the math department at MIT. And I, I remember going to a high school reunion and said, you know, so the question is, what what are you doing now? And I, I said, I teach at MIT. And people didn't know what MIT was. So, so uh, you know, Massachusetts Institute of Technology. So uh, Pretty famous anyway, that, that's what it is, Massachusetts <laughs> Institute of Technology. Uh, I started, I joined the, well, I went to graduate school at, at MIT. And then I joined the faculty in 1978. Mm -hmm. And I retired 42 years later in, in 2020. Um, you know, I decided in the fall of 2019 that I was going to retire in 2020. And my colleagues thought I was out of my mind because, you know, we have this job which pays really well and has no duties. So why would you retire from a job like that? And And then in the spring of 2020, the pandemic came and all of a sudden teaching was 10 times as difficult as it used to be. I, I understand that going to classes was more than 10 times as difficult as it used to be. But uh, anyway, then my colleagues thought that I was a genius for, for having gotten out of this game. When it, when it was hard. Anyway, so what I study are groups which are about it's the mathematical way of talking about symmetry. So one of the things we understand about physics is that the laws of physics should look the same in every direction. Um, a mathematical formulation of that is that the laws of physics should have symmetries coming from the rotations of, of space. That uh, well, that you, you know what it means to, to rotate space. And if you write down the laws of physics somehow, and then you do a rotation of space, the new laws that you get should be the same. Geometric things like rotations are in some ways the easiest things to think about. But for computation, the, the kind of mathematics where you can do the most computation successfully is linear algebra uh, matrices. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you learn in linear algebra to solve all kinds of problems by, by matrix manipulation. So what I really study is how to make any symmetry, maybe some geometric thing, into a group of linear maps, a, a group of matrices, uh, and in this way to make it computationally accessible. So there are lots of ways to make a, a group of symmetries into linear maps, and more or less my goal is to find all of them. Mm -hmm. and if you're lucky, this can help you understand the original symmetry better. So, so here's an example that I don't properly understand. I, I said that physics should, should have rotational symmetry. Mm -hmm. So in particular, if you want to study a hydrogen atom, it, it's got this nucleus in the middle, uh, and then these the interesting stuff from the point of view of chemistry and so on is how electrons yeah. operate around this nucleus. And they, they satisfy some physical laws and those laws have to be symmetric under rotation. Um, mm -hmm. So if you study the representation theory of the rotation group, it turns out that there's one representation 
for every odd positive integer. And what that tells you about quantum mechanics is, is that when you try to solve the uh, Schrodinger equation for the hydrogen atom, mm -hmm. you get one family of, well, a, a different kind of family of solutions mm -hmm. for each odd positive integer. Yeah. So the for, for the positive integer one, you get what physicists call the S orbitals. For, for three, you get the P orbitals. For SPDF. D, yes. yeah, SPDF, exactly. Uh, mathematicians say one, three, five, seven, but those numbers are kind of hard for physicists. So uh, that's that's an example. So yeah. that's what I do is I, I look for ways to, to make symmetry groups into matrices. Yeah, uh, because you mentioned about the Schrodinger's cat. Um, I've heard of it when I was quite young. Um, it's about um, a cat hidden in a cage and then it's like alive and dead at the same time. Mm -hmm. And then the moment when someone opens a cage, that fate is determined when another person sees it. So do you think this is actually true of uncertainty? <laughs> so there are a lot of actual physical experiments which show behavior that looks very much like that. Um, the I, I'm not sure what professional physicists think about the cat. Um, I, I think my guess would be that it's kind of a thought picture of explaining th these more subtle, small experiments where, where it's some electron which is doing one of two things and you don't know which it was until you look. And, and uh, that the cat is just an easier way to talk about that, that you, it's certainly true that nobody ever made the apparatus to, to make the half dead cat, but, uh, I, I my guess would be that it isn't possible. Because mm -hmm. I sometimes like uh, I I'm scared to check my grades. Like I, <laughs> I'm so scared, and then my mom tells me, "Oh, you have to just check it, Elaine." And then I just say, "Oh well, according to the principle of the story, <laughs> that it always changes, so it really depends on the time I check my scores." <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. But mm -hmm. uh, another question is that uh, because I. You're basically an MIT professor. Um, what do you think is the most interesting part of the MIT math pro uh, department or program that you find is really significant or? Okay. Um, yeah. So a great thing about MIT is that lots of the faculty in other departments have PhDs in math. Mm -hmm. And that means that almost all of the faculty know an enormous amount of mathematics. And, well, the reason they're in other departments is because they got deeply interested in where their mathematics came from. Uh, and and that's a really great thing to, to know about where the mathematical problems that you study, where they came from, and, and to get intuition uh from that it, well intuition about what the solutions are like intuition about what's an interesting question uh all sorts of things like that so i i love that uh, about mit that um you know that there's the economists over there who are mm -hmm. making models of the world using multivariable calculus and uh it, it's it's fascinating. Yeah. So it's a conglomeration of intelligent brains and yeah. one of <laughs> Right. Um, just a question here. Um, what is your favorite theorem and why? Um, do you have a favorite theorem in your years of study? So I what I wrote is that this is like asking a cat person which is his favorite cat. Um, but <laughs> Here's one nice cat. Um, if P is a prime number, uh, 
and you look at the rational number one over p mm -hmm. and you make a decimal expansion of that mm -hmm. then well as with any rational number the decimal expansion will repeat after a while and in the case of a prime number it repeats after at most p minus one terms uh whereas if you have a positive integer m that isn't prime then the decimal expansion repeats sooner than that uh before m minus one terms mm -hmm. so if you have a a number so that uh, some some integer m and the decimal expansion of one over m doesn't repeat until m minus one terms then it has to be a prime number and wow. uh so so for example one seventh is, is point one four two eight five seven repeating um and the what, what i so so i like this theorem because it's really accessible you know the, the, junior high school student should be able to understand the statement and a high school student who's reasonably clever can probably understand the proof mm -hmm. um but then th there's a question are there prime numbers are, are there infinitely many prime numbers for which the expansion doesn't repeat until p minus one terms if you well of course uh one third repeats after one term 0 0.333 three, 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 instead of two right. uh and one eleventh is 0 0.0909 0 it, it also it repeats after two terms instead of 10 and one thirteenth repeats after six terms if you write it down um but it turns out that there are well so in 1927 a mathematician named emil arten conjectured mm -hmm. that there were infinitely many primes for which the period for the decimal expansion of one over p was exactly p minus one and in fact he predicted exactly how many uh, such primes there there ought to be um so th this you know he made this conjecture in 1927 and it hasn't been proven yet um uh, in the 1960s the, there are some really famous um open problems in number theory well the one of them is called the Riemann hypothesis, and and then there's a generalization called the generalized Riemann hypothesis. Mm -hmm. And so, in the in 1967, a guy named Christopher Hooley proved that if the generalized Riemann hypothesis was true, then Artin's conjecture had to be true. Uh, so, I love this theorem because it starts in a really simple place that a lot of people can understand and okay. it, it goes towards uh unsolved problems and th there's lots of interesting stuff along the way yeah for sure um just a side note i also heard about the p versus np problem it's uh -huh. not really a two primes and number theory Ah uh, no, so so those aren't primes, you, you know. Oh, the, okay. uh, the, um, yeah, there are a lot of uh, problem. Well, it, in computer science, you're interested mm -hmm. in knowing how complicated it is to do some calculation. Um, so if, if you have two numbers and you want to multiply them. Well, of course, as the numbers get bigger and bigger, it gets more and more complicated. But the question is, how does it depend on how big the numbers are? If you, if you have two n-digit numbers, then the way you learn in elementary school to multiply them has something like n-squared steps. 
Um, so n squared, that, that's a polynomial in, in n. Mm -hmm. uh, and so reasonable problems for computer science are the ones that you can solve in a time that is a polynomial uh, in the size of the problem. So NP problems are, it, it's a class of problems which people do not know how to solve in polynomial time. Uh, so an example is if you have two graphs, each of which has N vertices, and you want to know, are these graphs isomorphic? Uh, you know, do, do, are they the mm -hmm. same graph? It's just that you've changed the numbering of the vertices or something. And uh, of course, it, it's easy. You, you have to just look at all the ways of matching up the vertices uh, and, and see whether then the edges match up. Mm -hmm. uh, but the number of ways of matching up the vertices is n factorial, which grows much faster than any polynomial in, in n. So the, the stupid way of solving that problem takes much more than polynomial time. Uh, and p is not equal to np is the conjecture that you there isn't some cleverer way to do this graph isomorphism problem, that mm -hmm. it, really takes uh, more than polynomial time. Mm -hmm. oh. Yeah. Maybe someone will prove how to get, like, maybe there will be proof for that in it's the next possible. year. It, 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 it's, there, I mean, nobody is close. That There are some things that, People know a lot of stuff to try that they know how to work on, but this one, I don't think there are any ideas. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe another Einstein in the future. Mm. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. So uh, what do you think? So currently a lot of high school students are struggling to find a pathway or they're, they're kind of, I would say, confused about their future. And a lot are thinking to specialize in math or maybe math, like pure mathematics, mm -hmm. will get them a good job or whatever. Uh, like, what do you think um, is the best way for high school students to actually, what should they do right now to um, prepare themselves to do what they really like to do, like math? Sure. So, Always, I think that people should be learning a lot of different things that um, because different things are, are different. <laughs> and mm -hmm. the, the ones that you, well, if you try a lot of very different things, you, you may find something that you like, uh, how do I say it? I, I mean, w w there there are thousands of different sports, and if if you try baseball and find out that you don't like it and you're not good at it, that doesn't mean you're not going to like croquet or something or tennis. The, these things are are completely different, and you'll never know which ones it is that you like until you try them. Mm -hmm. and, what happens is that as you move along in the educational system, as time goes by, you get less and less opportunity to to study broadly. Right. Uh, I mean, when you're in graduate school, it's hard work to take a course in biology or something. Um, whereas when you're an undergraduate, it's fairly easy. Um, and, and same thing in, in high school, you, you can do a lot of different things. And and I think that's good. Uh, partly what I was saying earlier that what's important about doing mathematics well is 
understanding well where some class of problems comes from. Um, so mm -hmm. there's a, a huge number of people doing very mathematical work related to biology. So the, the this human genome project or all the genome projects provides just buckets and buckets of data uh, about what our DNA looks like, what the DNA of other animals looks like. And the question is, how do you find meaning in, in those buckets of, yeah. of data? And, you know, math is very good at looking for some kinds of patterns in, in large sets of data, but you you can't just expect to look at DNA sequences and figure out the interesting patterns without a lot of understanding of biology. Uh, you, you need to understand the way transcription works and the way it gets regulated and, and the way proteins are synthesized and, and you know on and on and on all, all these things tell you what kinds of patterns can can be interesting in in dna tell you what sort of thing you should look for and then you know you can use mathematical ideas to to start looking for those kinds of patterns but but what's important is, is ha having this big picture of what the what the interesting problems are what other people can do, what they can tell you. Yeah, for sure. Like I've also heard that math is like a huge, even though it's one subject, but um, it's a huge, huge tree yeah. with various branches. And yeah. if you're good at one branch, you might not be good at the other branch or the other side of the tree. <laughs> um, so do you think, I mean, high school students, maybe someone like me, I wanna specialize in mathematics. Uh, should I right now be experimenting with um, biology, chemistry, and math and do a little bit of this and that? Or should I just focus on math and be highly de dedicated and choose one specific branch that I will be experimenting for the rest of my 50 years of research? <laughs> so I, I think most kinds of math, the interesting questions are really closely tied to some scientific origins of, of the problems. So, you know, there's a huge branch of mathematics of probability yeah. uh, and statistics. I, I mean, there's two branches. Well, wow. uh, and it's possible certainly to study probability in an entirely mathematical way. Um, but if you don't know anything about polling uh, mm -hmm. or, or anything about how Google orders its search results or, mm -hmm. or anything about gambling, mm -hmm. then you're not going to be able to recognize the most interesting questions in probability and statistics. Uh, I mean, it's not you know, there's many other things that there's diffusion in, in physics. It, it, if you put, if you have a sponge or something and, and you put some dye on one side of the sponge and it sort of oozes through the sponge, the, the way that happens is that there's some probabilistic stuff that, that goes on it. And studying those diffusion problems is a probability problem. Um, mm -hmm. but you should know about something about the physics of, of where those questions came from right. to understand what sort of, what, what kinds of questions you might try to answer. What, what, what are the, what's going on? Yeah. I think that's a, it's a really, really good suggestion. Uh, what do you think is the fundamental difference between um, just mathematics taught at school, like school math, uh, versus um, international or US math competitions? I, I think I'd just as soon not answer this because 
-hmm. more or less, I think that both students and, and professors uh, attach too much importance to competitions. Um, really? You know, mm -hmm. I, I've had decades of experience looking at, I, I mean, looking at my colleagues and, you know, people who are now my colleagues who long ago were students with me. And, you know, I, I know some of them did brilliantly in these competitions mm -hmm. and they're now brilliant mathematicians and mm -hmm. some of them had they they didn't want to have anything to do with the competition some of them tried the competitions and were no good at them <laughs> but they're they're now brilliant mathematicians it, mm -hmm. there are a lot of ways to do this stuff um and well it's sort of like home run derbies in, in baseball. You, you know, th th there's this stuff that happens around the all-star game e every summer where uh, they have a, you know, practice pitcher come out and throw easy pitches and the batters try to hit as many home runs as they can. And that's cool. Uh, but that's not well, and the people who are the best at that, sometimes they include the best hitters, mm -hmm. but there are a lot of ways to be a great hitter. And, and, mm -hmm. and this home run derby, that's not the whole story. It, it, it's that that's not what math is. Right. Um, so, mm -hmm. uh, so I wouldn't worry about that somehow. Right. Totally. Because um, I think math, you're writing groups and then you're, it's more creative. And for math competitions, I think it's um, more on a trained way of thought that you can, okay, I'm going to finish, solve this problem in, in less than one hour for this section. Exactly. Um, yeah. the, the, and that's the great thing about math it is that usually there aren't time limits. I mean, of course, there are places where people have to do things rapidly right. uh, and that matters but the 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 kind of timed behavior that the competitions test uh you know that that's one kind of skill but it, it's just not the only thing mm -hmm. it's really really true uh so Regarding um, today's society's progress, we have, I think, computer programming especially is taking over everything. Mm -hmm. um, friends that I've talked to, they said that maybe one day, like, robots can um, progress the society and why do we need humans? So do you think robots might take over the math industry? Like, do we even need mathematicians anymore? Can we just have robots to solve come, and come up with theorems? Is that possible? So I've paid a little bit of attention to um, theorem proving software. Mm -hmm. and what there is now is software which can help you translate uh, a sort of human mathematical proof into a step by step this statement follows from this previous theorem or this axiom mm -hmm. uh, a, a, a formal proof that you know there's there's no gaps um and that's a worthwhile thing to do uh, you know there are examples of theorems that had proofs in the mathematical literature but the proofs turned out to have gaps uh, years later um uh, and the, the software, I think, can can help people avoid that. That they, they, it can take a human created proof and, and say, "Yup, this this absolutely does what it says here." So so that that's a tool for humans. I don't think there is any software that is close to being able to create its own theorems. Mm -hmm. um, so 
I don't think, yeah, you know, I mean, it's it's impossible to predict the future, but I'd be really surprised if a computer were producing interesting new theorems in in 30 years from now. Yeah, so it's a fundamental difference between a robot and humans. So humans are more creative and we can create something yeah, I mean, new. There's a lot of things that need to be done again and again and again, and robots can be great at, at many of those things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. So uh, regarding, uh, as you mentioned, uh, predicting the future using um, math, um, do you think, like, there's so many, um, there's probabilistic functions, um, a lot of math equations, do you think it put together, we can somehow predict what's going to happen tomorrow? <laughs> using <laughs> massive math calculations and math modeling well that's what the weather people do all the time and they're, mm -hmm. they're getting better and better at enormously better at it. you know it's quite easy to measure how how good the weather predictions are mm -hmm. and the answer is that those guys are just way better than they used to be you know there, there are two things one, one is that they have much more data now uh and the other is that they have much bigger computers now that they, they can make use of these huge amounts of data so in some interesting and important ways it's always been possible to make some kinds of predictions uh, about the future and i think those things will get better and better but i i think you, you know even even such simple questions as who's going to win the election in six months we're terrible at you, you know people work really hard on mm -hmm. questions like that and they they don't manage to to get uh, well, it, if somebody is going to win the, elec the election by a factor of four to one, then mm -hmm. statisticians will be able to see that coming far in advance. But, but if it's going to be close, then we, we are not good at, at telling what's going to happen. And, and, and that's kind of the stupidest thing about predicting people's predicting the future uh, right. you, you know the things like predicting the next important new inventions i you know how, how do you begin to to think about that right so our society is basically not only constructed of uh, math it's also like this complex human brain that is just unpredictable like maybe some people it's really about choices made and then how this whole internal system actually goes like no one knows what would happen like yeah mm -hmm. i would say it's hard to predict everything with math even yep. though it's so i don't know but i think that um very few mathematicians like they barely have arguments or there's no um heated debates on something compared to the scientific fields how there's always like a writer um something that is debated but in math it's like right or wrong in a way usually that's true uh th that's the there are certainly fights about what's an interesting question what what directions should research go that there are really bitter fights about that uh but you're you're right that the question of what has or has not been proven is in a much better shape in mathematics than in almost anything else. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, another question is that: Do you think math is, in general? Do you think there is because it's, it has like a long long history do you think one day am i just okay we're we're done proving everything um basically how that works and then 
Do you think there is an end state to math? Nah. So w one, um, well, you could ask a similar question about any science, of course. Mm -hmm. And in the case of biology, for example, the the in a lot of ways the history of biology begins in the 1950s that there was a huge amount of stuff before that but what biology has been for the last 75 years mostly began in the 1950s and and so biology has only been going for less than a century and yet i don't think people would consider it possible that there was an end mathematics as you say ha has been developing for pretty steadily for for almost a thousand years and and by fits and starts before that uh, and it it just seems to grow faster and faster all, all the time so one of the reasons for that is that the goals change all the time um you know i mentioned the business about repeating decimals for for one over a prime the mathematics around that is, is modular arithmetic and sort of the number theory text that Hardy and Wright wrote in, in 1938 tells you everything there is to know about modular arithmetic, basically. But people study that enormously now because the, the security that makes ATM transactions private uh, depends on various ideas about modular arithmetic. Th they're ideas which appear in Hardy and Wright's book, but now, well, Hardy and Wright say, you know, you can do these kinds of calculations with modular arithmetic. And if you use the ideas in Hardy and Wright, then you can't read the the secret codes that are generated by ATMs. But people want desperately to read the, the secret codes that are generated by ATMs. And so they, all of a sudden, they care deeply uh, about the, these really elementary things about modular arithmetic. And they, they study that. They, they say, well, you know, the, you can describe easily to an undergraduate number theory class how the system for generating these secret codes from the ATMs, how that works. But there are a lot of things you can do wrong in implementing that system, which make it possible to attack the codes. Uh, and so, you know, basically what you need is two big prime numbers, and then you do some stuff. But if you choose these prime numbers badly, then you you can end up writing a secret code that that can easily be broken. and And so that's how do I say it? it you know, if, if you just read Hardy and Wright, it seems like any two big prime numbers should should do this for you. but uh, but in fact, it's more complicated than that. It, anyway, so what, what I mean is that right. the questions change all the time with technology and science, and that means that there are new problems that, that are interesting. For sure. So it's always, there's always endless ideas and then new things to develop and we're progressing forward. Seems so we're not moving backwards, are we? We're just... Well, certainly there are things that we've forgotten. You know, a hundred years ago, people who studied a lot of math in in high school learned a lot of solid geometry, and they don't do that anymore. Uh, 
and I'm not sure why it, it, it's, um, you know, that's hard stuff, solid geometry, uh, and to pain for the high school teachers to, to learn about it. And it isn't as valuable in calculus and so on as plain geometry is. Mm -hmm. So we set it aside. Uh, but there, there's something lost there. there. There are things that that used to be people used to know a lot about, which are are less widely known now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So another question is: uh, considering a math uh, tree, <laughs> do you mm -hmm. think? Do you personally? I, it's a personal. Uh, Oh, is this your cat? It's so this is cute. One of two cats. This is the one that likes my lap. Oh, I love cats. Yeah. <laughs> I'm definitely a cat lover. I, I, I'm not a like a dog person. I love cats. <laughs> Certainly love cats. So cute. Definitely. Oh my so. god, so cute. <laughs> best, best, best companion ever. <laughs> yeah. It's also, it's sort of like, I, I like to think of it as like a little pillow and it, it just lies on you. <laughs> yes. Definitely so, oh, you're so lucky to have a cat. <laughs> have many cats or just one? Two. Two. Oh, uh, that's great. Yeah. Are, are they good friends or they fight for they're you? They're brothers and they're extremely close. They're usually, they're within 10 feet of each other. You know, they, they sleep in a, tangled pile most of the time they they do of course fight too <laughs> yeah um they definitely love cats i have to get maybe a, this the this the same kind of cat that you have right now <laughs> definitely mm -hmm. yeah do, do, do you think um cats uh do they are they logical <laughs> do they, are, they, are they mathematically <laughs> Uh, that <laughs> they, they can do a lot of uh, amazing physical feats, balance feats, jumping feats, which the, their instincts and their muscles know how to do amazing yeah. stuff. Uh -huh. uh, I, I, I don't see. <laughs> <laughs> There's not very much behavior that that looks uh, actively intelligent to me. Mm -hmm. I don't know. So uh, regarding your um, research, um, the, like your whole research Philip um, experience, um, of course, your best companion has always been your cat. I was. <laughs> has it ever gave you like an epiphany, like a thought of oh? This is a math question that my cat gave me some. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think so. No, mm -hmm. um, the what when I've, uh, I mean, after I finished grad school, I, I had a job for two years that had no teaching requirements, and so I was just supposed to think about math all the time. And mm -hmm. there are people who can do that but i'm not one of them so you know you have to find other things to do which kind of allow the math to happen in in the back of your head mm -hmm. uh, and i i made a great many cookies in, in that in those two years that that's um so lo lots of times uh after making a batch of cookies you know i would know how to take another step in something mm -hmm. i mean it, it's it's clear that I, I think for most people when they get a large problem clearly laid out in their minds then their minds work on it even when they're not directly concentrating on it and, and so you know, you wake up in the morning and and you say, "Oh, what what I need to do is is this." And 
Um, I, I don't know how exactly that works, but but it's mm -hmm. cool. Have you ever dreamed of a math equation and then something like, oh, you were walking in the park and yeah. I, I've heard extreme places like people are um, mathematicians taking a shower and then suddenly, oh, I, I found um, a theorem or something like that. Super. Yeah, so I, I can't think of anything particular like that, but as I say, lots of cases where something has been percolating in the back of my head and I, I sort of suddenly realize what to do next at a time when I haven't just been sitting and, and working on it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, previously you have mentioned um, a list of, I don't know, like 10 books I highly appreciate. Like, wow, a really good professor, <laughs> really nice person. Um, uh, would you recommend maybe one particular book that and then um, explain the significance or what you really like about it to maybe high school um, listeners here or around the world? Do you think um, what's your one maybe or two recommended? <laughs> I think that it's different for everybody. Um, the, you know, th there are a lot of books about the history of, well, I, I could say books about the history of mathematics, but really books about mathematicians, books about um, the lives of people who were doing mathematics. And I think that can be a really inspiring thing. Uh, you know, the, I, I mean, there's a woman that I know almost nothing about named Ada Lovelace uh, from the 19th century. Uh, and she, There was a, a guy who's fairly famous in the 19th century, whose name I won't remember, maybe it's Charles Babbage, uh, who designed a, a mechanical computer. Mm -hmm. And Ada Lovelace had the ideas for how you could program this computer. I mean, she, she was the one who first understood that there could be such a thing as a computer program. Uh, so that's somebody that I would like to know more about. Uh, th there's a Russian woman named Sonia Kovalevsky, um, who is, again, from the 19th century, mm -hmm. who's responsible for some of the fundamental theorems uh, about solving differential equations. Mm -hmm. um, and she, you know, I mean, obviously it can be difficult for women in mathematics now. In, in the 19th century, it, it was to all intents and purposes impossible. Um, and, and yet the, these individuals somehow uh, managed to master huge amounts of mathematics and then contribute to it. Uh, I, I think this is just stunning. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, but, so th there's a book which I enjoyed. Um, I don't remember if I put it on my list of 10 books, but it, it was, um, yeah, I, I I can't remember the title now. It, it was a collection of, of mm -hmm. I mean, set, a two or three volume collection of um, short pieces, mostly about individual mathematicians or individual theorems, you know, a collection of things that were four or five or 10 pages long. Uh, and I, I just, I, I found this 
completely delightful mm -hmm. uh, that um, I uh, oh th there is a book uh, no I, I don't know that I I I think the right thing to do is, is to find a place to look at a bunch of books mm -hmm. and find something that catches your eye. Yeah. You know, because it, it'll be different for everybody. Right. Uh, uh, I, I got this book as a present from the American Mass Society, and I, I don't know if it's worth. Yeah, sure, problem. Uh, yeah, it, it, it's called uh, the, the Life of Primes in Thirty Seven Episodes. Wow, that uh, sounds really interesting. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, it, it's kind of a history of of what people understood about prime numbers yeah. um, and uh, there's no so uh, I, I was th there's some wonderful work from two or three years ago uh, about primes and I wondered if it was in this book and it's not uh, mm -hmm. so it, have you ever heard of this uh, twin prime problem? I heard someone talk about it before, but I don't really know that much about it. So twin primes are two prime numbers that differ by two, hmm. like 11 and 13 or 17 and 19. And the twin prime problem is to prove that there are infinitely many pairs of, of twin primes. Mm -hmm. uh, the, and this is incredibly difficult. Th there's, uh, but there was some really amazing progress made on it uh, about, I don't know, five or 10 years ago, maybe 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, a, a mathematician who nobody had ever heard of uh, published a proof that there were infinitely many pairs of primes that differed by at most 70 million. Uh, nobody had ever been able to prove that you, you could get any finite bound on, on how far apart successive primes had to be. Um, so th this was just a huge shock to to the mathematical world um but but then uh, of course 70 million is too big and and people wanted to make this number mm -hmm. smaller uh so there's a mathematician at UCLA named Terry Tao and he's an yeah. expert on this kind of number theory mm -hmm. and he organized did he call it wiki math uh he organized a, a sort of web-based thing where lots of mathematicians could contribute to to a proof that you could improve the 70 million bound. That, you, you know, there were lots of pieces to the argument and, you know, you could try to make little pieces of it better. Um, and so I, I thought that was an amazing thing. I, I think hundreds of mathematicians contributed to it um and and they got the the bound down to i, I forget maybe a thousand or so or something wow. and and then there was a single mathematician whose name i forget um uh, who got the bound down to 200 and something or and so all those stories 
are, are different kinds of amazing stories. You know, the, first of all, there was this guy who could barely get an academic job. No, nobody thought his work was worth anything, who mm -hmm. got th this huge breakthrough that uh, on a problem that just looked impossible. And then there was Terry Tao, who, who's a world famous mathematician, making a club of, of hundreds of people to work together on this problem successfully. And, and then there was James, whatever his name is, who did the old single handed, you know, young hotshot thing of, of yeah. making it even better. So, it's three different kinds of success stories and you know different people like different kinds of success mm -hmm. stories. and um yeah so i was hoping that this story was, was in the book it, it isn't but there there's um there's uh a lot more um uh, th there's a lot more stories like that uh, yeah but i love your recommendation it's definitely wonderful um I'll probably also share your um the the uh, 10 recommended books <laughs> the as well um because it's just great um i mean different people have different um preferences so depends on the readers like Absolutely. what that person likes so yep. yeah yeah, but um, thank you so much for answering my long list of questions and of course preparing um, a lot for them. I highly appreciate that.